unfortunately he accepted me for training and let me stay at the at the headquarters at Mount at the SRF headquarters in Los Angeles. And then after three months, he sent me to Phoenix. We had a branch. They had a branch center in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I, I was sent to Phoenix where I did my my uh, spiritual practice. But every two months, I went from Phoenix back to California at his request to be with him a few days wherever he was at one of the centers. So I had that personal contact with him on, on those scheduled scheduled visits. And uh, I took to the monastic life very, very, very well. I, I enjoyed the silence. I enjoyed the the discipline. I enjoyed the long hours of meditation. And then. Uh, in 1951, um, I was ordained. He ordained me, and I wasn't ready to teach at that time. But he was preparing uh, for the future because he passed in March 1952. So he ordained me in the autumn of 1951, and uh, with the understanding that it would be later that I would be uh, able to to teach and to initiate. And he was, he was very spontaneous. <clears throat> Some of you have read his books, I'm sure. He was very spontaneous, I imagine, like your Baba is here. And uh, I remember when I was, uh, when he ordained me, it, it, there was no pre-planning. You couldn't go and join, be a monk, and then be told that in two or three years you can be ordained to teach. It was a matter of, of qualification. If you, if you were ready to be ordained, he saw that you were, he ordained you and authorized you to, t to teach and initiate. If you weren't ready, you could be there for years and it wouldn't happen. But I remember on this occasion, <clears throat> there was no uh, discussion about ordination. And I was visiting Los Angeles with the senior minister from the Phoenix Center. Uh, we were there for a few days. And the night before we were to leave and go back to Phoenix, a uh, master came in from a, an errand. He, and his car was parked on the lower driveway by the building. And uh, some of the resident disciples gathered around the car, and he talked with us for a few minutes. And then he invited uh, Herbert, who was the senior minister from Phoenix, and myself to go up with him upstairs to the top floor where he had his private quarters. And we went up, we went up there, and he sat in a chair in the hallway, and we stood. And he gave uh, Herbert some uh, advice on uh, about the Phoenix Center and asked about some of the members there. And then it was almost like a, an afterthought. He was getting ready to dismiss us, and we could always tell when he was going to conclude a, a, a time with us like that because he'd be, he'd be quiet. Then he'd say, all right. And that was good, <laughs> goodbye, you know. And he, classes of the spiritual eye, and we would go. And so he got to that stage where he was quiet. We knew his aurite was going to come out any moment. And he said, oh. He liked that, like he, like he thought just came into his mind. He said, oh. And I was standing here, and Herbert was standing in front of him. And he said, kneel down. And so I knelt by his chair, and he put his hands in my head, and he ordained me. And he said, uh, teach as I have taught. Heal as I have healed, and initiate devotees of God into Kriya Yoga. And that was that was it. And when I remember right after that, uh, when he took his hands away, <coughs> Herbert was standing watching. And Herbert was two years my senior. And he said, oh, sir, is Roy to initiate into Kriya Yoga? And Master said, you too. He said, the same God who is in me is in you. And what I have done, you should do. So that's how he, he was with us, very spontaneous, you know. But, uh, he was, a master was very strong and very, uh, when you're with him, you felt safe. There was this, a little like with Baba there, there's this quietness, this centeredness, that strength right there, you know. And master was like that. Very, uh, sweet-natured, very patient, very wise. Yet he could be a strict disciplinarian when he had to. He didn't like to, he didn't like to discipline people. He told us that when he met uh, Sri Yukteswar, when uh, he was out of, uh, out of uh, 
out of high school that uh, I was talking to Clifford on the way down today. He told us when he met Sri Tuswar that for the first two or three years it was very challenging for him because Yogananda's nature when he was a boy he was he was impulsive, devotional and impulsive. And Yukteswar was tough. He was loving and fair, but he was tough. He, there's one way to do it, and that's my way. <laughs> and uh, so Yogananda told us it was very difficult the first two or three years to relate to that ty type of discipline. But he admitted that he needed that to, to balance his personality and prepare him for his mission to the West. So Yogananda was like that. He was, uh, he was, he was kinder and more patient outwardly. But when, it, when he had to, when he had to be a disciplinarian, he could be. And then he would usually soften it a little bit. He would say, "I only do this because I want you to be as strong as I am." But uh, so it was a marvelous experience for me at that time. And when I went over to visit him on those occasions those regular occasions, uh, I never went with any sense of need or, or, or with, with, with a lot of questions to be answered. I just wanted to be in his presence. But invariably, he, he would say something or do something that would meet every need that I had, you know. And uh, I remember the first thing he said to me when we had our first private talk, uh, when I first met him, uh, just before he dismissed me, his advice for living there and entered into the, the program, he said, uh, read a little and meditate more and think of God all the time. And then uh, almost uh, well, two, two years and two months after that, just before he passed, I visited him over at his desert retreat at 29 Palms. He had a small house out at 29 Palms. And I was visiting him there just a few weeks before he passed. And he was in vibrant health. He was looked good. And uh, we talked for a while. He had me in the living room. We, sat, we had always sat close. And he, we talked for a while. And I, he did, I let him do the talking. As I say, I didn't go with a lot of questions. He would talk about God and the saints and tell anecdotes about the gurus and so forth. And then his parting, parting advice on that occasion, just before he blessed me and sent me out, was he got quiet. Then he said, uh, don't bother yourself with what others do or don't do. And he said, don't look back. He said, look straight ahead and go all the way in this incarnation. And I knew what he meant by that, because I heard him talk before, you know, liberation, God, realization, liberation. And then he said, and you can. That was his last advice. First was read a little, meditate more, think of God all the time. The last advice from his lips was <coughs> look straight ahead, go all the way, and you can. This is how, this is how he was, you know, he was always reminding us, emphasizing what was important. There was a gentle, soft side to him, but he always got down to, he always, he, you never left his presence without being reminded of why you were here on, on the planet, you know, what the purpose of life is, the ultimate purpose.